Do you remember when Apple built a version of Mac OS that was running on top of Solaris and HP Unix? <laughs> this, is, this is a real thing that happened. The Macintosh application environment for Unix from way back in 1994 is a very real thing, a very awesome thing. I, I wrote this article, it's up over at lunduke.locals.com, but I, I wanted to read it and, and talk about it just a little bit because I have some additional thoughts I, I kind of wanted to share. If you're if you're getting the podcast version of this, uh, head on over to lunduke.locals.com and get the get the whole video version. If you're anywhere else like YouTube or anything, go to lunduke.locals.com. It's better. There's no ads, and you can support the work I do and get all these articles right when they come out. Because this, this one's been out for a while. So I'm going to read a few bits here. Uh, back in 19 the 1990s, Microsoft developed software, Internet Explorer, Windows Media Player, Outlook. Experience, Express, etc., for both Solaris and HP UX, which we also have articles on over at lunduke.locals.com. So go check out this and click on it, and then you find all that. Which brought a small dash of Windowsiness to Unix land. By the way, I worked on some of that. <laughs> but did you know that Apple brought the entire Mac System 7 over to Solaris and HP UX? This is true. This is true. First release in 1994 and discontinued in 1998. It was called the Macintosh Application Environment, and it really, really works. Uh, I should note that the Macintosh Application Environment is not a UX also, also known as Apple's Unix system for some of their 68K Macintoshes. These are two totally different beasts. Apple has had a lot, and I mean a lot, of toes dipped into the Unix waters for quite some time. This is, but this is a different thing. So if you have a Sun Spark station running Solaris 2.4 or an HP Unix workstation, such as HP UX 9 or 10, you can run an entire Mac system 7. something instance right within its own little X window. For real, it has the ability to, to copy and paste text and graphics between the Mac and the Unix applications. All right, here's a screenshot. This is a screenshot that Apple itself used to promote this crazy little beast. Note the X Windows logo. Note that it's, it's the common desktop environment. But note that inside of a window is a full-on friggin' emulated Macintosh. I mean, it's, it's, it, it's not just emulated. We'll, we'll get into that. It, it's, it's amazing. So that screenshot is CDE, the common desktop environment, which was de facto on Solaris and HPUX back in those days and is still one of my favorite desktop environments. But technically, there's no reason that the Macintosh application environment can't be run on other desktop environments on top of either system. In fact, here is a screenshot of MAE booting on Solaris running GNOME. Yeah, that's Solaris running the GNOME desktop, GNOME 2, with macOS booting up inside of it. That's awesome. That's just awesome. It's awesome. Um, so that, 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 that was just, uh, that blows my mind. I love it so much. Before we go any further, we need to take a detour over to Apple.com for a minute. And I'm not talking about Apple.com nowadays. I'm talking Apple.com from back when the final version of the Macintosh application environment was released in 1997. And not really apple.com per se, but mae.apple.com. And here, I'm going to show you the screenshot of it because this is serious. This is what that website, that beautiful, glorious website looked like. I'm going to slowly scroll down. If you're listening to the podcast, you are missing out on all the amazingness. Go look at the video at lunduk.locals.com. Here we go. We're going to scroll. Okay, there's a there's a there's a monitor with a, with a rainbow coming out of it, cool, Apple colors, Macintosh application environment. Okay, now what's happening here on the left? That right there, <laughs> this, is, this is the official Apple corporate website, ladies and gentlemen. This is not a hobbyist webpage. <laughs> I'm gonna scroll back up for a second. Like, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there's a lot of fascinating information here. Um, uh, how Apple handled the demo version, the prominent 1-800 number listing, but what in the what? Let's zoom in, upper left quadrant, enhance. Yeah, look at this glorious man right here. <laughs> that right there is what we call a decision. Someone, <laughs> someone was working on this website at Apple back in the late 1990s and was thinking to himself, I got it. I got it, guys. I know just what this website for the Macintosh application environment for Unix needs. <laughs> it's that. 
It's powerful stuff. Powerful stuff. I, I was pretty on the fence about this whole Magos on Unix thing, but then I saw this sumo wrestler in a tutu wearing a ti tiara, and well, that totally... He's also on a skateboard. I should point out that he is on a skateboard. There's a sumo wrestler wearing a tiara, wearing a tutu, wearing ballerina slippers on a skateboard. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so this is the coolest thing that Apple's ever done. I mean, I mean, let's just be honest. And there's nothing that cool on Apple.com nowadays. So let's put that aside for a second. So how does this thing work? Is it a virtual machine? Uh, yes, it is. Mostly, sort of. Uh, here, in fact, is the uh, a, a direct screenshot from the white paper that shows how it has a 68K an emulator and a lot of other things. So, but what it is essentially is a 68040 emulator with a Mac ROM and System 7.5.3 sitting on top of it. Though its performance, thanks partially to, I think, that wonderfully named Mac Unix scaffolding chunk in there in the middle, was quite reasonable. So let, let's look at this here, right here. You notice this Mac Unix scaffolding right there above and to the side of the 68K emulator. Um, you know, what all that touched it beyond just the copy and paste, unknown, but the performance was quite good. Uh, side note for a second, I worked for Hewlett Packard back in the late 1990s, uh, supporting HPUX and other Unix workstations, and I ever only ever saw one machine with the Macintosh application uh, 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 environment in use. Um, but I recall thinking that it wasn't the fastest Macintosh you could use at the time, but it wasn't the slowest either, which... Honestly, I found it impressive uh, because it's, it's emulated and running inside of another Unix system. This system, by the end, was pretty doggone powerful. You could copy and paste between the Mac virtual machine and Unix software, and you could access all of your Unix partitions from inside the Macintosh, thanks to the scaffolding. <laughs> Um, uh, here's a here's a, another uh, another screenshot here of it working. Uh, note the toolbar along the bottom to provide some extra Unix integration features, right? So some you know copy and paste and uh, send things to X and that sort of thing. And uh, oh, here here actually here's kind of an interesting thing: a detailed breakdown of memory usage. Right? This is from the uh, from their their documentation. Um, it actually lists the different pieces and parts of this and how much RAM it used. Uh, the native code and data, 4.25 megabytes. Uh, the scaffolding and code for the 68040, 1.5 megabytes. The macOS ROM code, two megabytes. The macOS system code, application code, and data, 16 megabytes, but you can make it more. The graphics buffer was 0.3 megabytes, running using a total of 24 megs. Um, and you could you could you could up it quite a bit more, and you could actually make the system code or the the Mac environment use as little as eight megs if you really wanted to shrink it down. Now, how awesome would it be if software nowadays shipped with details about memory usage like that? We use this many megabytes for code over here, and this many this this many megabytes for the graphics. But that should be a thing. I'm just saying that's awesome. Also, only 24 megabytes of RAM in total. The 1990s were awesome. I'm sorry, that was awesome. Now, supposedly, even Apple Talk worked. Now, at least that's according to the user's manual, which is different from the administrator's manual. I link to all of that in this article, so you can grab copies of it. It's very cool. Um, I never used the Apple Talk version of it. My, my time playing around with this on actual HPUX hardware was very limited, but uh, in theory, it all, it all worked. Now, installing the application environment was really old school. It was very Unixy terminal. This is what the installer looked like. How great is that? I'm sorry. That's just awesome. That can you imagine if 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 Apple shipped installers that look like this nowadays? How glorious, man. Uh, and here's the about screen for the demo version of the very very first release. This is the about screen from 1994. Uh, the virtual Macintosh for open systems. Awesome. Awesome. And then here's a here's the trial and demo version. A screenshot of the trial and demo version with some features. Now here's what's crazy. Check this out. This is a screenshot from the trial version, and I'm putting it here because it, it makes me laugh. Note the gigantic, huge 1-800 number banner all along the bottom of the window. It's just so 
big. And, and simply seeing the, the 1-800 number on a screen in an application window is kind of jarring, right? Like you don't expect to see that nowadays. Like to, or, like normally you just have like a link and you click it and you go to a website and order it. But instead, you could, you could send an email to someone to, to talk to an Apple representative or you dial this 1-800 number and dial one particular extension weird right like it, it just brings you back to the 90s and here's another screenshot a very colorful screenshot uh with the uh the macintosh application environment 2.0 running and uh just just fantastic and you know here's something worth pondering on this was back in 1994 in context here are other things that came to pass and were released in 1994 linux hit version 1.0 at a time when linux was just hitting 1.0 you could get an HPUX or Solaris machine running a full version of, of Mac OS inside of it with decent performance. And Windows 95 was not out yet, which means Windows 3.1 was the king of Windows. And yet here we have what, in my opinion, might almost be the, the epitome of 1994 awesome computing desktop technology. You have a full, powerful Solaris uh, or HPUX Unix workstation with a fully tightly integrated with scaffolding Macintosh environment to run all your Mac software and games, right? And you, you, you couldn't do anything, anything this massively powerful and cool on either Linux or Windows at this point. I mean, yes, Linux at 1.0 did have a lot going for it. And Windows 3.1, it was a powerful system, whether you know many people want to think it was or not. But... I mean, HPUX or Solaris plus full Macintosh System 7? I'm sorry, that's rad. The idea of being able to do that uh, is pretty amazing. Oh, and here's a, here's a quick little screenshot that I think was interesting. I also linked to it so you can go check it out as well. Uh, there was a time when Apple had mailing lists. That, that right there is a screenshot of the Macintosh application environment uh, user lists that people could just be part of and send questions to and help people out. And Apple published the full archives for these mailing lists for people to search. I'm going to tell you right now, it was a very different time at Apple. Apple was a wildly, wildly different company back then. Not just was their hardware infinitely more upgradable and repairable than it is nowadays. But they were making, they had several Unix projects going on at the time and multiple like advanced OS projects happening. And they, they just were doing so many different things. It was amazing. So a couple of final parting thoughts. Number one, this is Apple making and selling and supporting a running a version of the Mac operating system on non-Apple hardware, even hosted on non-Apple software, stuff they just don't do anymore. You can't put Mac OS on anything that doesn't have a big glowing apple on it. And number two, that sumo wrestler in the tutu, that guy is something. Let's scroll back up to that dude because that guy is awesome. Look at that. Look, look. Ballerina slippers, skateboard, uh, something around his knees, <laughs> tutu, tiara. <laughs> they chose this. Corporate chose this to put it on the website. That's what we're going to use to promote our OS running on Unix. It's pretty rad. It's pretty rad. Um, all right, everybody. Uh, if you are not currently subscribed over to uh, over at uh, lunduke.locals.com, you are missing out on all this stuff. Articles galore, podcast videos, all the good stuff. Go to lunduke.com. All the links are there. Uh, you can get you can get deals where you can you can subscribe to all of my sites all at once. You can do monthly or yearly deals to save some money. It's it's fantastic. Go over there, get all of that stuff. There's no ads, there's no, uh, there's no sponsorship, there's no big tech money or influence in any way, there's no trolls, and over at lunduke.locals.com, there is no politics at all. I have a separate site because I'm a man, I'm a human, I'm a red-blooded American, and I have political ideas, but I do not put them on lunduke.locals.com. Do occasionally I share them on YouTube? Yes, I do. Do occasionally I put them, do all the time, almost every day, do I put them on conservativenerds.locals.com? Yes, I do. But if you don't like my politics, or you want to ignore my politics, or you just don't care to talk about politics on the internet, I don't blame you. Just go to lunduke.locals.com, 
where people of all of all shapes and sizes, of all styles, of all political whatevers can all hang out and bask in the awesomeness that is truly great computing. Right, retro computing, new computing, uh, Unix and Linux and Mac and Windows and Amiga and Commodore and everything, a little Atari over here. All of it's good to go. All of it's fair game because all of it is awesome. We focus on the joy of computing. Sometimes there's an article that's a bit of a bummer, but most of the time it's just the joy of computing, ladies and gentlemen. All right, everybody. Thank you for hanging out. Thank you to all of you subscribers who make it all possible. Couldn't do it without you. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, nerds and nerdettes around the world, I do declare and broadcast.